Welcome to the podcast from Morningstar UK, the leading provider of independent investment research. This week, we discuss the somewhat volatile start the markets have had in 2018, what investors should do during these periods of uncertainty, and what opportunities there are during these times. Let's get straight into our main topic. Emma Wall, Senior Editor for Morningstar.co.uk and Killer Conco's Rachel Winter discuss why stock market volatility is a good thing and how investors can take advantage of the fall by viewing it as a buying opportunity. So over the last week, we have seen the FTSE 100 fall in value. And in particular, over the last couple of trading days, we have seen increased volatility across global stock markets, triggered by jobs figures from the US on Friday. What should investors do about this new market environment? Well, I think the most important thing is not to panic. And actually, I'm quite relieved to have a bit of a fall in the market because it's been going up so consistently for such a long time that some areas of the market did look quite expensive. I think people were getting quite nervous because there hadn't been a drop in the market for so long. People were almost waiting for when that was going to be. So actually, I think it is a good thing that some stocks are starting to come down and hopefully we will start to see some buying opportunities. In my view, I think this is a short term, a short term thing. I don't think it's the start of the next five financial crisis. I don't think it's going to be a huge market crash, but I think it's natural that markets are volatile. And I think it's good that we have seen an end to the very consistent level of rising that has been the case over the last year. So it seems that you're saying this is not the beginning of the end, but this perhaps is the beginning of increased volatility. Is that something investors should be prepared to stomach then going forward? We will see this increased volatility in markets. I think so, yeah. In my view, that's how markets should operate. They should be a bit up and down. They shouldn't be consistently rising over time. They should really be going up, going up in line with global growth. And over the last year, we've seen markets far outpacing global growth. So I think it's good that the valuations have come down a bit so they do correspond more to more normal levels. And also, the reason the markets have been so high over the last few years is because interest rates on bonds have been so incredibly low. Now that we are expecting interest rates, particularly in the US, to rise, and that was perhaps encouraged by the the strong comments by the Federal Reserve last week, they've started to say they are feeling very positive about the US economy. That's caused people to think that perhaps now wages will start to rise, that will cause inflation, that will then cause interest rates to rise, perhaps faster than people are currently expecting. That's going to mean that bond yields will rise, and therefore, when, when bond yields do rise, that tends to cause a bit of a wobble in equity markets. So I suppose your message then is don't panic and look for buying opportunities. Exactly. So we'd always use the phrase, it's time in the market, not timing the market that counts. It's very, very difficult to predict when the market's going to rise and fall, but it's much easier to pick a great stock, a company that you have a lot of confidence in, and hold that stock for the longer term. So if you do have a diversified portfolio, then I would just keep hold of it and ride out the volatility. Rachel, thank you very much. You're welcome. Up next, Morningstar Investment Management's Dan Kemp urges investors to ignore the market noise and focus on their long-term goals. He offers three tips for riding out periods of stock market volatility. Periods of market turbulence can be especially dangerous for investors as they tend to elicit an emotional response and heighten the behavioural biases to which we're all prone. Left unchecked, these biases can lead to us making poor decisions which can harm long-term investment returns. We therefore need to find a way to overcome these biases, and here are three ways that may help you do this. First, remember that investment is a long-term pursuit, and put all recent price movements in this context. While a 4% fall may feel a lot, it means little in the context of a 10 or even 20-year investment horizon. Second, try to avoid the sensational headlines that can lure you into action. It's normally better to read books than listen to forecasts. Third, if you're going to look for opportunities, ensure that you have a robust framework for assessing the real value of assets. This will provide an anchor for your expectations and help you avoid overreacting to short-term price movements. And finally, remember that investors tend to make too many decisions rather than too few. So if in doubt, do nothing. And within the Morningstar Managed Portfolios team, we'll be spending today as we spend every day, assessing the value of each asset class, digging into the fundamental drivers of returns and challenging each other's views. While this is nowhere near as exciting as making quick-fire trading decisions, it reflects our observation of how the most successful investors operate. 
What are the triggers for stock market volatility? While it is near impossible to accurately predict stock market movements, there are warning signs investors can look for which could cause increased volatility, says Tai Hui, Chief Asia Market Strategist for JP Morgan. Hi, Tai. Hi, good morning. So we are officially in correction mode now. Overnight, there have been developments can you let me know the situation as of now for global markets? Well, I think what you've seen is that the S&P 500 obviously corrected by 10% uh, since the uh, end of last week. And what we have right now is really a market starting to uh, worry on a number of fronts. For example, with inflation accelerating and therefore the Federal Reserve has to move more than three times they're currently predicting. Um, and, and subsequently, we've seen really a... Um, uh, I would say a, a, a catch up between the bond market and the equity market where the bond market previously was predicting very uh, slow growth, low inflation. The equity market was really reflecting strong growth, good earnings. Now those two views are coming together. I think it's that coming together is creating all this friction and volatility in the market. Because the initial losses were gained again and then we've, we've gone down. This volatility pattern, is that the new norm? Should we just be prepared for more of it? Uh, the latter question is yes. I think we should have uh, prepared for more going forward. But I wouldn't call this a new normal. I think it's all normal coming back because if you look at 2017, whether it's in the US equity market or global equity market, it was extremely calm. It was unusually calm. Um, and if you look back to, for example, Asian equities or even US equities, an intra-year drawdown of 10% or 15% is perfectly normal. So I would argue, obviously, it's very uncomfortable moments for all of us, but I would argue that this is something that uh, equity investors are very much used to. Again, think back to August 2015, where the equity market, again, uh, corrected by 11% in over a four to five trading days. Um, with a lack of fundamental reasons, the market does return to a stronger footing. So I would argue that this is a similar environment. It's just that the bond market and the equity market are coming together and that's creating all this volatility. And again, if you look at, for example, the corporate credit market, the foreign exchange market, the level of volatility remains relatively low. So I would think that this is much a, of a, a correction in the equity space rather than the whole financial market telling us that uh, the economy is going uh, in a downward moment. Equity markets are almost impossible to predict accurately. However, there are particular triggers that cause this volatility. It was the jobs figures from um, last Friday from the US looking more positive than expected. Are there particular flags that investors should be looking for that, that could perhaps signal greater volatility going forward? Well, I think uh, given that inflation is now the name of the game, obviously inflation data and also the Fed's comments are going to be crucial. In particular, um, given that we just had the transition of the Fed leadership from Janet Yellen to, to uh, Jay Powell, uh, how he uh, communicates with the market is going to be crucial. I think the March FOMC meeting is going to be absolutely critical because um, obviously the market is currently expecting the, uh, the Fed to raise interest rates by 25 basis points. Um, but on top of that, uh, their dot plot, their economic forecast, I think we will tell us a lot more how the Fed views the current environment and their rate projection. And that, to me, uh, will again be very telling. Another point to bear in mind is, again, if I just wind back to August 2015, you did have uh, the Fed postponing a first rate hike since the financial crisis from September all the way to December. And the question now becomes, if this volatility continues for another few weeks, would the Fed adopt the same position or would they brush that aside and focus on the growth and the inflation picture? I think that, again, will set the tone for a lot of investors. So inflation and Fed comments, I think, is crucial. Ty, thank you very much. Thank you. So how does one invest in a volatile market? Even though global stock markets have made up the losses from earlier in the year, investors should prepare for increased volatility in 2018, warns our next guest, Thomas Puliak, Head of Multi-Asset Solutions for T. Rowe Price. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Emma. So what a week we've had for global equity markets. We saw considerable sell-offs, but they have rebounded somewhat. This volatility was a shock for many people, but I don't think it was for you because you were saying towards the end of last year that people should be more cautious on equities. Volatility will return, won't you? Yes, we had four themes to, to start 2018, one of which was volatility to rebound. We thought that the, the calm that we had throughout 2017 was quite unusual and we were due for a, a sell-off which occurred in the past week after a strong month of January, which makes the year quite flat now. 
And how does one invest in an environment where volatility has returned? Because for many people, investing over the last couple of years, they just simply haven't seen volatility. It's been remarkably low. Yeah, and volatility is part of the, uh, of the game when you invest for the, the long term. We think that when you have time in front of you, you can still be uh, heavily invested into risk assets. And the environment is still conducive in terms of uh, growth earnings for the, the medium term. But yet, you still have to position your portfolio and hold some assets which might protect you. That's why we have some overweight in bonds, cash or long-term bonds which can protect on the volatility. And that, that's a good point to make because you are a multi-asset investor. Not everybody has all those different levers to be able to pull. But you still think that there is some gain to be made from equities, but presumably not the sort of 20 plus percent that we saw last year. Definitely, we were expecting quite modest uh, middle uh, single digit return this year. The, the key would be earnings. So earnings are challenged with the, uh, the rise of, uh, of inflation, but also the economic environment is still positive for, for growth to be there. So we are not expecting uh, price multiple expansion, but we are really seeing growth in equity driven by earnings. And that's why we are uh, overweight in um, countries or sectors where we see uh, better earnings like outside the US. And where are those outside the US countries? Is it about emerging markets again this year? Because 35 percent, not bad for 2017. Yes, yeah, so emerging market uh, did uh, better during that uh, episode of volatility. We see that, uh, especially in Asia, we are more comfortable in, uh, in some of these um, sectors, like uh, even technology, which we favor in some of our portfolios. Uh, Japan and Europe are also in developed uh, world um, regions where we will have overweight in our, in our portfolios. And I suppose the concern when volatility like this returns, and indeed people like yourself are saying we're taking a more cautious stance, we're holding more cash, more bonds, is that actually this is the beginning of the end. It's, it's not going to be just volatile. It's going to be a falling market. Do you think we've reached that point yet, that the market cycle has, has come to an end? We don't think so. When we uh, talked about volatility at the beginning of the year, we were talking about a correction and not a bear market. Why is that? Is because the economic environment is still uh, positive. We are not uh, seeing any sign of recession yet. So that means that uh, after this correction, we should see a rebound, uh, which could be in some cases some buying opportunity for investors. So do you think that this year will just be about capital preservation or do you think it's about low amounts of growth but the last little bit eking out those last gains from the market cycle? Yeah, you have to be careful of trying to uh, trying too hard to uh, to gain these, uh, these returns. What we see is that uh, there is a potential for active managers to really uh, be, do well in this environment where the market beta will be lower than what we had but alpha has a potential to add value and a higher contribution to total return. So we think that's a year where active management, being nimble in the asset allocation, will be uh, more uh, fruitful for investors. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Up next, Morningstar Investment Management's Sarik Bourbon examines the recent poor performance of UK equity income fund manager Neil Woodford. What should investors holding Woodford's fund do? Hi, Sarik. Hello, Emma. So Neil Woodford has been in the press a lot over the last 12 months, but not for positive reasons. Why has Neil been making headlines? Obviously, the headlines have been related to uh, his, his performance and the fact that a couple of his holdings, uh, some of the high-profile holdings he's had, you know, have been in the press with some negative news surrounding their businesses and their share price falls. And are these the type of companies that Neil normally holds? Because his performance of the last 10 years has been pretty impressive. This seems out of character. So I think there's two things. I mean, one, Neil has you know, a tremendous track record. He's been investing for about 30 years. And you have to think that he has invested in generally undervalued companies for a very long time that have been different at dif different points in time. So, you know, at the moment, he's, he's got about a third of his portfolio in companies more exposed to domestic UK economy. And obviously, these are under pressure in general. Uh, but it has happened in the past that he has had exposure to actually some similar names that he has in the portfolio now, such as when he had some exposure uh, to some of the Babcock, some of the top styles, et cetera, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and also in the early 90s, 91, 92, 93, you know, in the midst of the kind of recession. So he, he has had similar positionings to certain names like this on the domestic side before. The second aspect is obviously mistakes. 
and obviously some of the high profile stocks that have been reported in the press you know have been in some cases mistakes and Neil has acknowledged some of these mistakes. The important thing to remind ourselves is any fund manager will make mistakes in their portfolios when they select stocks. Generally we say you know the best managers will get about 60% of their stocks right versus 40% wrong. When you think about 40%, you know, in actual number of stocks, that's actually quite a big number for the best managers. At the moment, Neil actually is, is running with a hit rate that's more about 20% right versus about 80% wrong. R wrong being in share price term, in the short term. He has a long term view and we have faith that, you know, he's sticking to his process, obviously amidst the kind of challenging environment for the UK economy, for some of the stocks, for some of the businesses, but he looks at the valuation of these businesses compared to what he believes should be a fair price given the cash flows and the way the business are operating. And that's an important point to make, isn't it? Because even the very best fund managers cannot be 100% right on 100% of their portfolio all of the time. Neil, in fact, was unpopular with his call on pharmaceuticals in the past. So is the message just hold the fund for now and wait and see, take the long term view? Very true. I think, you know, it's, it's important to remember that the performance pattern of Neil's fund in the last 12, 18 months is not dissimilar to what has happened to his fund before. He obviously underperformed significantly in the rebound in 2009, 2010. He also lagged massively in 2009 until the kind of beginning of 2000 when the tech bubble burst. Uh, so he has had similar extent of underperformance. You look at the share price movements of some of the stocks, some of the stocks down 50, 60, 70 percent. This is not very dissimilar to some of the stocks he held, for instance, in tobacco in, the, in 1999. You know, some, some of the big tobacco stocks of today were down 40 to 60 percent in 99, for instance. So what, in your opinion, as a fellow shareholders, should investors in Woodford Equity Income do? So in my opinion, investors should stick to, to, to the fund. It's very often when performance is very challenging, when a fund manager is under pressure, uh, that you should stick to it uh, as long as that fund manager you believe is doing similar things into the process. Obviously, his investment team is very much unchanged. His process is very much unchanged. One, he's taken a macro view before, very different to, to the market. Generally, he's been proven right. And two, he stick to some sectors, some companies that have been unloved, where he's taken a different view from the market at the stock level. In, in, in my view, as long as he still does that, there's no issue holding his fund in the future. And finally, it's worth making the point that we have seen a lot of volatility in markets over the, the, net, the last week. And I expect that Neil will not be the only fund manager over the course of 2018 to have periods of, of underperformance. Is this the new norm? This is the new norm. I think, you know, it's it's going to be fund by fund as well. So a lot of funds that have done phenomenally well in the last five, six years, you know, have been, have been riding some themes. For instance, you think about emerging market or US equity funds, you know, if you've had exposure to internet related names, tech names, you've done phenomenally well. Some more value oriented managers haven't had exposure to those big themes. Those might not last forever. That is a strong message that investors should remember. Things and themes do not last for forever in a straight, in a straight line. There's always a price for these. And when the price is too expensive, it basically has to revert to a more normal price. And on the other side of the coin, obviously, fund managers like Neil Woodford might actually start thriving when valuation discipline starts reverting in terms of investors' mindsets changing to more normal levels. Sarik, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Market volatility can spring up pockets of opportunity. Russia, for example, has the potential to significantly outperform other stock markets and is currently 40% cheaper than other emerging markets. Sarik Bourbon stays with us on the podcast to explain more. Russian equities have been one of the best performing markets in the last few months. In particular, Sperbank has been a very strong contributor and Sperbank accounts for about 23-24% of the Russian index these days. We believe the trends we've seen recently can continue in the long run where Russia has potential to significantly outperform other markets globally on the equity side. First reason is valuations. Russian equities are still about 40 to 50 percent cheaper than, say, emerging market equities. And even embedding a level of conservatism, we believe the expected returns for Russian equities are still significant. Secondly, thinking about the earnings picture, there's potential for the portion of the index in Russia, which is about half in energy, it's of oil and gas companies, those companies have room to significantly increase their earnings. And we should see in the coming months and coming quarters 
uh, the kind of feeding through from higher oil prices into the bottom line of these companies as the cost base and their currency exposures should constitute a significant tailwind. So in short, we remain high conviction in uh, Russian equities for the long term, especially when compared to other markets, such as emerging markets. And we believe the earnings picture should be a significant driver to that re-rating. Another opportunity worth looking at is India. The International Monetary Fund has predicted India will drive global growth in 2018. And Prime Minister Modi has made bold promises. What does it mean for investors? Joshua Crabb, Head of Asian Equities of Old Mutual Global Investors, is our final guest on today's podcast and speaks with Emma Wall on whether India can live up to Modi's hype. Hi, Joshua. Good morning. So India is a very topical conversation at the moment because of what's going on at the World Economic Forum in Davos. The IMF came out with figures at the beginning of this week saying that India would drive global growth next year. And indeed, then Prime Minister Modi got up and was very positive about the outlook for India. Do you share that optimistic view? Absolutely. Um, you know, without a doubt, this is just a very, very simple catch up story to me. You know, we've seen this with the going way back over time, the US catching up with Europe, then Japan catching up with the US, then Korea catching up, Taiwan and China. And now it's time for India. And that productivity gain is going to drive much stronger growth than we're going to see anywhere else in the world for an extended period of time. Now, how does that translate to investors? Because, of course, economic growth does not necessarily mean stock market growth. Absolutely. So many people forget that. Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's helpful. Um, and you need markets where that actually uh, translates into you know, outcomes that are good for an investment. Now, one of the big problems you have with India is it's a great story. And like great stories, it comes with a great price. So it's quite an expensive market. It's done very well, particularly since the election of Modi. And this is where we think you need to be not so focused on the index level, because there are lots of parts of the market. But you really need to delve into other to work what are going to be the specific stories that you're going to make money out of. And what are those specific stories? Well, for us, and we've seen this starting to play out. If we think about India till now, and I'd say you know everyone would agree with the structural story, and and people will tell you that structural story has been there for a long period of time for the catch up. Modi is the catalyst. You've had political issues in the past. We haven't had like one, um, you know, I guess party dominating. And now that's the catalyst that's changed. Now, this is where I guess we differ from quite a few other people. Because over, over time, India has still been a decent investment case. People have owned IT services companies, pharmaceuticals companies, a lot of these export oriented companies. You've got a small amount of very highly educated people at much cheaper labor costs. And that's been the story. Now, when we think about what it's going to take to take India forward from there, it's going to be very different. And what it's going to be about is it's going to be getting back to my point before. It's going to be what China did, what Korea did, what Taiwan did, what the US did. It's about taking underemployed people in rural areas, getting them working in full-time jobs, being able to take some of that money they earn, buy a motorbike, start to save a bit of money, maybe buy a house and it kickstarts it. Now in order to do that, the one thing India needs above all else is infrastructure. Power, roads, rail, it doesn't have it. Anyone who's been there can see that. You can land into the nice new airports that they've got in Delhi and Mumbai now, but after that, there's not much. And that's what they need to do. Now, people already have the mindset that that's sort of bad in Asia, because people think about the overinvestment in places like China. Um, and China is going through a very different change. That's going through its consumption change. And we think they're the areas you really want to be focused on. People think steel's bad. People might think that cement's bad, these type of areas. But these are the ones which are cheap within the market context. And that's what's important. So these things that have been terrible for many years, because there hasn't been that growth, are now going to be good investments. And within the market that looks quite expensive, a lot of these are still very cheap. Is India your favorite Asian economy or Asian stock market, I should say, because you do have a remit across all of Asian equities? Yeah, look, I never try to think about it as just there's one thing to do. You need to look at, you know, multifacets. Otherwise, you're just betting on red and black. So, you know, for us, you know, India as a market has been a very good market. Now, I think it's much more about what you own within that market. In the shorter term, we probably think other markets like China are more interesting. Why? They're cheap. They're hated. You go back a year ago, the RMB was going to collapse, the banking system was going to collapse, the real estate market was going to collapse. The Chinese markets are, um, you know, probably 50 to 60 percent since the lows. It's still on a single digit multiple when you look at the HSCI. And, you know, you don't have those same structural stories um, maybe as much, but you've got other things going on. Pollution control is having massive impacts, creating massive, uh, you know, investment opportunities. The banking sector is very cheap, <coughs> generally very hated, but a very, very attractive sort of in the, in the sort of short term. And so that's, that's a market that we quite like. Moving to another area, quite similar to India, is Indonesia. 
Indonesia, very large population, very low penetration, very similar story on fixed asset investment. Not quite as clear cut on the politics, it's not quite as the same mandate that Modi has, but still that great opportunity, and because of that more uncertainty at a cheaper price. So there are lots of them. I could talk about Vietnam, I could talk about various other markets as well, artificial intelligence, um, to talk about something that's a little bit more sort of edgy, but there are lots and lots of opportunities. And what we're trying to do is have quite a few of these sitting differentiated alpha sources sitting in what we're doing. Joshua, thank you very much. My pleasure. And that's the end of this edition. We hope you enjoyed this programme. From everyone here at Morningstar UK, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.